This is Your Life, an American television tradition brought to you by Polygrip, the cream adhesive that holds dentures tighter. Now, here he is, Mr. This Is Your Life himself, Ralph Edwards. Hello, everybody. This airplane is a giant B-52 jet bomber, and we're here at an historic and vastly vital location. Why this is so, you'll see in here later. We're at the Edwards Air Force Base, 300,000 acres in the high Mojave Desert, 90 miles north of Los Angeles. 12,000 Americans live and work up here. I'm standing in front of one of the hangars belonging to NASA, which stands for National Aeronautics and Space Administration. This is a civilian agency composed of scientists, engineers, test pilots, and many other people, all necessary to the research and testing of aircraft vital to the peaceful exploration of space. From this base has flown and returned safely the fastest flying, highest flying airplane in history, the X-15. And inside that hangar, you'll meet the pilot of that amazing plane and learn amazing things about one of man's greatest achievements. Now, while I move in on them, Bob Warren has something important to say. Bob? Thank you very much, Ralph. You know, loose false teeth can be annoying and painful, but there is a good solution to this problem. Here's a story about a cream adhesive that helps, Polygrip. Loose false teeth? Watch. This is natural biting power. But when you lose your natural teeth, you unfortunately lose your natural biting power. Now there's a discovery that acts to restore your natural biting power. Polygrip, the cream adhesive that grips loose dentures as powder never can. Let me demonstrate on this bite testing machine. First, I'll sprinkle some regular adhesive powder on this moistened plate. Now, I'll spread Polygrip cream on this one. See how this powder splatters unevenly, while Polygrip spreads evenly to create a tight cream seal between plates and gums. Now, let's see what this means when you're actually eating. You bite down and chew. This powder lets go, but Polygrip cream grips. That's how it works to restore your natural biting power. If you have loose dental plates, act now to restore your natural biting power. Use Polygrip cream today. Now back to our This Is Your Life host, Ralph Edwards, who is inside a NASA hangar here at the Edwards Air Force Base. Hey, how are you doing here, fellas? This, uh, it's a beautiful looking plane. Uh, is it an X-15 or a scale model? Is it a scale model or a full scale model? Full scale. You must be Joe Walker, the man who flew it 169,600 feet high. <laughs> and then, what's the matter? And then 3,307 miles an hour on May 25th. Gee, that's almost a mile a second, isn't it, Joe? What's the matter? Uh, you startled me. Well, my, uh, <laughs> my name's Ralph Edwards, and, uh, I also know that you were born in Washington, Pennsylvania and like to climb mountains, right? Sure do. <laughs> uh, do you know how I know? Somebody snitched on <laughs> <laughs> Joe, it's very simple because it's all in this book. Joseph A. Walker, scientist, war hero, holder of world records for speed and altitude and controlled flights, and one of those fighting for our place in outer space. This is your life. Lynn Manley, who's been such a help to us here. Thanks, Lynn. Well, you know, Joe, there's a lot of things going on around here classified as top secret, but I'll bet this was about as well kept as any of them, wasn't it? Huh? Sure know it. You better sit here in the pilot seat right here. Sit right up there, because this is worse than last Thursday. <laughs> <laughs> That's when you took the record-making flight, wasn't it? Yes, indeed. Well, we'll take off on a flight into your past and see what goes into the making of a man like Joe Walker. We'll start at Washington, Pennsylvania, where, as we said, you were born, right? The 20th of February, 1921. That makes you only 40 years old, Joe. And you're the firstborn of a young couple named Thomas J. Walker and Pauline Walker. You live a happy childhood on your father's farm. Uh, picture there, Joe, little brother John. And you attend the Lagonda Grade School. 
Joe always was good in books, but he was mighty handy with machinery and tra tractors and tools and everything like that. A voice that has meant much through the years, that of your father. Thomas Walker here from the old farm in Washington, Pennsylvania. Here's Dan. <laughs> what do you call us? Kind of sneaky. Kind of sneaky is right. Well, you know, even the audience here didn't know about this. Did you, ladies and gentlemen? <laughs> oh, some of you may, may have who were in on the personnel. Most of you didn't. And boy, it was a tough secret to keep. This fella, it was all over the place today. Yeah. Just like him. We almost ran into each other in the cafeteria, and I zooped out the <laughs> other side. Oh, boy, I, I wouldn't want to go through this again. I tell you, you say your son had a way with tools and machinery, Mr. Walker? He sure did. Well, he was quite young. I suppose was about 12 years old. He built himself a little scooter out of an old discarded uh, farm motor and a buggy that we had there. He got the thing to run, too. Remember it that? It ran all right, but one problem, he didn't put any brakes on and couldn't get the monster stopped. Another boy from the Walker farm, your brother John, here from Clarion, Pennsylvania. Here's brother John. <laughs> John, you sort of stuck with the soil instead of flying 30 miles over it. Yes, I did, Ralph. I'm now employed by the Pennsylvania State University as extension agricultural agent in Clarion County. You know, Joe always kept us well supplied with model planes since this was one of his favorite hobbies when he was a child. Yes. It was a good thing that Joe was handy with his hams or I would never have had a bicycle. Another of the Walker clan, your brother yeah. Tom, now a standards engineer with Humphrey Incorporated in San Diego, California. <laughs> what about the bicycle, Tom? Oh, well, we had an old hand-me-down bicycle and the time got through the other three and to me, why, it was somewhat of a wreck. <laughs> Joe fixed it up and showed me how to keep it in running order, and I had something to ride on it. Well, uh, he also made you something else to ride on. Remember these, Joe, right over here? Yep. What do you call those? <laughs> Yankee scooters. Yankee jumpers, I think, scooters. <laughs> There's still another walker, your brother Paul, now a helicopter pilot with the U.S. Army in Germany. You must be very proud of your boys, Mr. Walker. Sure am, Ralph. Nice bunch of boys. Yeah, bet they are. What? Why don't the walker men sit down in here, and we'll okay. cruise over some more of Joe's life. Does your wife know about all that? <laughs> well, you don't think we'd tell everybody, do you? <laughs> you attend Trinity High School, where you make good enough grades to be chosen second honor speaker at your graduation in 1938. You win a scholarship, and your yearbook says of Joe Walker, small but mighty. You grew up a little, didn't you? You consider engineering for a profession, win a scholarship at Washington and Jefferson College, and begin your serious study of science. Joe and I were not in the social world at Washington and Jefferson College because we were both farm boys. We both brought our lunch to college. Well, that's got to be your longtime college friend, Roy Zimmerman, now hey. from Woodland Hills, California, and his wife, Winnie. <laughs> Now, uh, I understand that you two had a hand in writing the physics handbook used at Washington Jefferson for years, Roy. Well, besides being a good student, Joe was also quite an athlete. One time before a track meet, the coach uh, approached Joe and asked him to enter the uh, mile run. He said, it's easy. All you have to do is start out sprinting and just keep on sprinting. Well, Joe apparently took him literally and he started off on a dead run. <laughs> Uh, at the 220 mark, he was clocked as the fastest 220 for the day. Uh, the same thing, the same thing was true at the half mile mark. Uh, Joe eventually was pretty worn out, but by that time he was so far ahead that no one else ever caught up, and he won the race. And Joe has a pretty marvelous place in my life too, for he was best man at our wedding. Thank you, Roy and Winifred, Winnie Zimmerman for helping us tell the life of Joe Walker. <laughs>
During your final year at Washington and Jefferson, you and Roy make extra cash by working as assistants in the physics lab. You both uh, also enroll in the civilian pilot training program at the college. I operated the flying school where Joe got his first lessons, and I could tell if this boy had the stuff it takes. The man who owned the flying school where you first spread your wings, and the man who checked you out, R.E. Buck Springer, here from Wayne, Pennsylvania. That's not what you told me one day. <laughs> It's been 20 years since I've seen Joe. You spotted Joe from the first? Yes, Joe had the seriousness and tenacity that I knew would make a good pilot. However, uh, I got a little tough with him. Well, in his own interest, of course. Well, you see, Joe, in addition to his college work, had other things to do. So in order to make him put out the most, I kept telling him that, uh, hey, if you don't cut it, you're out. Yep. Well, any effect from it? Uh, definitely. In the Pittsburgh area, he was the highest uh, aviation cadet. And, of course, look at what the man represents today. Right. It's the results that count. Thank you, Buck Springer. Joe. <laughs> <laughs> Good that after 19 years, you'll enjoy being with Joe and Roy and the others. Joe, at the uh, party for him tonight at the officers' club here on the base. Uh, while they're in California, your friends and relatives have been staying at the Hollywood Roosevelt Hotel where accommodations have been provided for them. They can all come up to Lancaster. <laughs> it's 1942, and there's a desperate war on. You join the Air Force as a cadet. The following year, you're commissioned a second lieutenant. You're in the North African and European theater of operations, flying P-38s on dangerous reconnaissance missions. You set the stage for huge bombing raids over strategic points in Europe with your P-38 Chuggin' Charlie. For continually braving hazardous weather conditions and ever-present enemy opposition, you're awarded the Air Medal with seven Oak Leaf Clusters. On July 10th, 1944, General Nathan Twining decorates you with the award of the Distinguished Flying Cross. How can we top that except with one possible incident? You were based in Bari, Italy, and were walking down the street. A horse was standing nearby. What happened, Joe? Uh, he disputed my right to passage. <laughs> <laughs> Did you bite him or did he bite you? I've forgotten how. No, I've I never know, been known to actually bite anything. <laughs> <laughs> then it was he that bit you. Right back here. <laughs> I wasn't going to ask where. <laughs> <laughs> it's September 1944, and you've flown 58 missions, which add up to 600 hours. A medical report says that you're suffering from flying fatigue, flash temper, impatience, insomnia, and restlessness. It doesn't... Doesn't sound like you, Joe. Nope. It did then, though, I guess, eh? I think they stretched it. <laughs> so war-weary Captain Walker is sent back to the States to recover. In 1945, you're again a civilian, and to show how sick of flying you are, you buy this airplane. Right, Joe? Yeah. <laughs> what is that, old uh, Stearman? Stearman. You worked on it. Oh, boy, did we work on it. <laughs> Tom, you say something about that, Ralph? Yes, Tom. Well, what, as the 4th of July, we were all out in the wheat field celebrating the holiday in our normal manner, so we see this uh, bucket of bolts, I guess you <laughs> could call it, come floating down and land nearby and looked around and wondered what somebody was doing lighting over there, so turns out it's Joe. He comes over and asks us if anybody would like to take a ride. And I'd never been up before, so he took me up. I bet that was quite a thrill. <laughs> yeah. Getting out of that hot wheat field was, too. <laughs> <laughs> no, I no. first met Joe in 1945 in Cleveland, where I was with the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics. The man who hired you for the NACA, Joe Benson. There are all kinds of deals going on around here. Did you hire Joe as a pilot, Mr. Benson? Uh, no, Ralph, uh, we needed a physicist, and uh, Joe's educational background uh, filled the bill, so he was hired as a physicist. Yeah. What's that taking off? That's one of the boys there now going. That's taking off on the lake. Yeah. You picking that up there, Dick, old oh boy? Well, uh, did he live up to expectations with you? Uh, yes, he did, Ralph, but not as a physicist. Uh, he only held that job five days. Oh. Joe, I'm surprised what happened. <laughs> Well, it was two days longer than I wanted it. 
I think you were walking past the hangar and you heard something like we're hearing out here now, or a P-38 or something, you decided to fly. You became a test pilot engineer, right? right? Uh, yes, he did, and he did some very important uh, research work for us in Cleveland. Uh, later, I was uh, transferred out here to our facility at Edwards Air Force Base, and a short time after that, Joe came out. So you two have worked together for 15 years. I'm very proud to say that we were. Well, how you two, together with many other dedicated Americans, make some of the most dramatic flying history of all time will be exciting to learn. We'll hear and see it after this message. The aim of the news department of the National Broadcasting Company can be stated very simply. To report the news clearly, comprehensively, and rapidly. The measure of its success can be stated just as simply. In many cases, more people see news events on NBC than the total of the other two networks combined. Literally hundreds of NBC newsmen are at the ready 24 hours a day. Men the caliber of David Brinkley, Frank McGee, Irving R. Levine, Joseph C. Harsh, and Frank Burkholz. Men like these are in Moscow at this very moment. And they're in London, in West Berlin, in Paris with President de Gaulle, in Washington and at UN headquarters in New York. That is why news specials, often on the air only hours after they're happening, are able to explore important developments in depth, clearly, comprehensively, rapidly. And that's why you have learned to rely on the news department of the National Broadcasting Company. And now Edwards Air Force Base, back to Ralph Edwards and tonight's principal subject, the man who has flown an airplane faster and higher than any other pilot, Joe Walker. Uh, you know, we've been here all day and there hasn't been too much noise. Now we go on the air. I, I think it's what's my line sabotaging us. That's what I think, you know, at least. <laughs> it's 1949 and you find time to take your mind off science and flying at a church social. I was a member of a group called the Coeds at the Lakewood, Ohio Presbyterian Church. Someone who made you think of something more romantic than flying, your wife, Grace Walker. Here she is. Boy, you must have been pretty sneaky about this whole thing, trying to get me out of the house, huh? Was it love at first sight, Grace? I wouldn't exactly call it that. Um, after the party, Charlotte and I made a list of the boys there and discussed each one. Well, where did Joe stand on the list, Grace? Uh, he didn't. We crossed him off. <laughs> <laughs> well, now, uh, of course, uh, he was a flyer, and uh, you were interested in somebody a little... Uh... Safer and saner. Well, but he managed to finally get on the list. Yes, and after that, the others were soon crossed off. Well, Grace Walker, if you'll sit beside Joe over here, your husband, we'll find out more about what has made him famous. Our country is in a tense struggle for supremacy in the air and outer space. In 1944, it was decided to experiment with high-speed rocket planes, and the X-1 is conceived. It makes the first supersonic flight in 1947. The D-558 is next and is flown successfully, you being one of the pilots, Joe. Other models follow and you fly them, extending again and again the world records in speed and altitude. Then comes the X-1A. You remember that one? In all of space, 1955, all of us spent a half hour expecting to be blown up any second. The voice of one of the two men who saved your life that day, Charles Duke Littleton, who still works with you here at NASA. <laughs> it must have been quite a half hour, Duke. It was, Ralph. Joe was to fly the X-1A that day, which was being carried aloft in the bomb bay of a B-29. At 29,000 feet, everything was going smooth, and Joe began the final checkoff list. Suddenly, there was an awful explosion. I dove into the bomb bay to see how Joe was. Mm -hmm. uh, the another explosion knocked me down, and the white vapor started pouring from the X-1A. But yes. well, I went after Joe with Duke. This fellow showed his concern for Joe Walker, too. Jack Moyes, now here at the base with North American Aviation. Come over here, Joe. We've put you in the middle of these two fellas. Didn't you realize that unless the uh, pilot jettisoned the X-1A and Joe, you all might have gone up in another explosion, Jack? Yes, we all knew that, but uh, Joe didn't let it happen. Actually, Joe saved our life. Uh, while Doke and I 
I went down to get the canopy off the X1A. Joe was turning off all the switches and trying to get the remaining fuel out of the X1A. Now, Mr. Benzel, you were in charge of the operation on the ground. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, Morris and Littleton managed to drag Joe out of the X1A into the B-29. He promptly passed out due to lack of oxygen. They supplied a, an emergency mask. And he came to again. His first concern when he came to uh, was to save this complicated uh, ejection seat in the X1A. I ordered them to forget the seat, and the X1A was jettisoned. And for this, Charles Littleton and Jack Moyes were awarded the highest award given by NACA, the Distinguished Service Medal. And Joe and the pilot, Stanley Bouchard, were given the Exceptional Service Award. Thank you. All of you work harder at your jobs. Other rocket airplanes follow, and Joe, you fly, many of them. Then comes something you may unknowingly have been training for all your life this beautiful thing, the X-15. You and two other pilots are chosen to make experimental test flights with it. Here you are all together over there. You, Joe Walker, representing NASA, Major Robert White, U.S. Air Force, Scott Crossfield, representing North American Aviation, builders of the X-15. Now, when you get that X-15 up there where there's no air resistance, how do you control it in flight, Joe? With reaction controls. Little rocket jets in the wing and in the nose to adjust the attitude of the airplane so it keeps going the same way we are. <laughs> now for a moment, let's watch Joe in action. Joe, you watch over there and tell us what's happening. Watch the monitor now. We're in the X-15 hung under the wing of the B-52 on takeoff. Starting to climb up uh, to reach our launch position and altitude. The pilot gets in the X-15 before the B-52 starts taxiing. Now we're doing our pre-launch. There we go. That vapor you saw was the engine prime, mm -hmm. and that picture was taken from a chase airplane. This is a landing approach. That skis on the back? Then? Skids, right. That looks like one of the better ones there, too. Boo! <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. I could feel that all the way up here. <laughs> Quite a difference from little Joe Walker's ride on that uh, one-runner sled, the Yankee Jumper, is that what you call it? Oh, I don't know, about the same kind of a jolt. <laughs> <laughs> it's August 4th, 1960, and your names and headlines. You've flown a controlled airplane nearly 2,200 miles an hour, a world's record. May I say a word about those headlines? Of course, Winnie Zimmerman. Well, just before the headlines, we invited Joe to dinner. And just after the headlines, he came. The neighborhood children were very, very excited. And we found that one of our daughters, Susan, was out selling tickets for the... <laughs> selling tickets? <laughs> yes, for the youngsters to come and look through the fence and watch Joe swim. <laughs> How much? Five cents each. <laughs> Five cents a peak. Well... Here are the children of your closest friends, Eileen, Susan, Irma, and Beth Zimmerman. <laughs> oh, boy, the little business girls. Uh, which one of you girls sold the tickets to see Joe Walker? I did. Well, I'd like to talk to you right after the show, Susan. Thank you very much. Then, uh, just last May 25th, in order to learn more about stability and control data and heating information, you fly the X-15 3,307 miles an hour. Irma, did you see yourself on television? That's something that has made every American and every member of the free world feel proud and take heart. Mr. Joseph Vinsel, Chief of Flight Operation Division here, would like to make a special award. Would you stand up here, please, uh, Mr. Walker and Mr. Vinsel? You're going to make the award? Uh, Joe, I know you don't like to uh, talk about this, but uh, do you recall uh, an operation again in the X-1A that we had to cancel? The drop, uh, you buttoned up the cockpit, got back in the B-29, but you forgot to pull in the nose pool. Yeah. What happened to it? <laughs> kind of got bent. <laughs> <laughs> well, in behalf of all of your NASA associates here, we would like to present you 
with that boom of the X1A. <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey. It'll look great over the mantle there. You save it for him, Bob. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Benzel. Now we know that Joe Walker's a great home man, even built his own firm, uh, own uh, home from the ground up. Uh, you call it the house that lack of Jack built, right? <laughs> well, and your lawn and garden have won uh, prizes. Well, we have some ideas about that home, which we'll get to after this important message. Welcome to the shortest game on record of concentration. I'm Hugh Down. Hey, uh, Hugh. Art. Yeah, Bill. Hugh's gone nighttime. You mean Jack Parr now has a daytime show? <laughs> no, but Hugh's daytime show, Concentration, is going on in a nighttime version, too. Well, that's great. When? Well, it's on at a... Hugh, when is it on? Well, I'm glad you asked that, Bill, because I'd like to tell you. Nighttime Concentration is on Monday nights at 9.30. Well, it is good to know that, Hugh, and there's one person I'd like to tell that to right away. Oh, who's that? Art James. <laughs> Art, Concentration goes on Monday night at 9.30. 8.30 in the central time zone. Art. Well, thank you, gentlemen, both. But uh, how about playing this game? Shall we start? Well, uh, I'm sorry, but our time is up for this game at this time. However, you can see how we play the game by tuning in Concentration Monday night in color at 9.30. That's 8.30 Central Time on most of these NBC stations. Bill, do you suppose he's trying to tell us something? Uh, yes. He's got his bowling ball in the car. He was going to go bowling tonight. No matter how high or fast you fly, Joe Walker, the eagle's nest is home. And here are the ones you build it for. Your sons, Thomas, James, and little Joseph, in the arms of your brother, Captain Paul S. Walker from Augsburg, Germany. Ralph, this is certainly wonderful. This is about the first time Joe and I have seen each other for about eight years. Well, we hope you can enjoy each other for a few days. You better be good at bowling. He was going to go bowling tonight. Okay. Now to get back to the Walker home. Paul, you stick around here. We know that... Uh, go ahead, sit down, Joe, if you want, and everybody. We know that raising uh, things and making them grow is still important to you. So from the Porter Cable Machine Company uh, comes this rugged and powerful Mark I suburban tractor and attachments. <laughs> now, <laughs> now you can really tear up the place there. The uh, new den that uh, you have just built with your own hands will be furnished with this beautiful correlated group of den furniture in Danish teak provided by the Shield Chair Company, whose name is the hallmark of fine furniture. Uh, as a scientist and music lover, we know you'll enjoy this wonderful Robert Stereophonic 990 tape recorder. Let your two boys, other boys, come over here and stand right behind you. Provided by Robert's Electronics. Isn't that a beauty? With this, you can record forever the sound of your family's voices. And with this Bell & Howell 16 millimeter electric eye uh, camera, you can record their pictures, and you'll be able to see those pictures as well as what's happened here tonight with a 16 millimeter Bell & Howell sound motion picture projector, both provided by the Bell & Howell Company. Joe, for a personal gift for Grace, your lovely wife, this beautiful gold charm bracelet Bob Warren is presenting there, designed especially for her and presented to her by Marshall Jewelers of New York City, Grace. Joe Walker, you make me. We're sure that the real gold there lies not in its sunshine or rocks and hills, but in the hearts of people like the Walkers. This is your life. Good night, Joe, and God bless you. Travel arrangements for guests on This Is Your Life are provided by TWA Trans World Airlines, who fly the super jets. You fly the finest when you fly TWA, the super jet airline. This Is Your Life has been presented by Polygrip. The cream adhesive now in this economy size package. A complete wrap up of the summit meeting and the Kennedy Macmillan talk in London, Monday at 10.30, 9.30 Central Time on NBC.